Okay. Uh, as Dee then said, I'm going to be talking uh, tonight particularly about the, the Buddhist psychology and the therapeutic approach that we use on our training schemes. But I also want to talk quite broadly because I think that, you see, I think when, you, when one works as a therapist, one sees a lot of fear, one sees a lot of sadness, one sees a lot of distress. And therapy tends to talk in terms of individuals. It's, we think of it in terms of like one person sitting in a room with one other person. And, you know, this is often the picture of what's happening. But I, I think that for me, it's important to always remember that whoever we are, whenever we have a conversation with another person, we are actually not just one person talking to one person. We're all coming as part of cultures. We're coming as part of the family that we belong to, part of the social group we belong to, part of the profession we belong to, part of the religious group we belong to, part of the nationality we belong to, and so on and so forth. So I don't believe that therapy and therapeutic work is just about individuals. I think that individuals are embedded in a much bigger field. And I'm interested not only in the psychology of the individual, but also in the way that the psychology of the individual is part of that collective process. And, and I think that this is really what Buddhism is about and what Buddhism teaches. You know, we are connected. We are conditioned. We are all conditions for one another. We are all interconnected. You know, we don't exist in isolation. It's easy to think that, you know, maybe Buddhism, you know, if therapy is one-to-one, -one, maybe therapy, maybe Buddhism is just one. You know, sitting on one's cushion, meditating, going inwards, withdrawing from the world, but no. Buddhism is about connection. And connection takes courage. This is why I picked the title, Courage to Feel. Now, this, the theme for this uh, festival is Courageous Compassion. And in a way, I think my title is a reforming of that idea. Feeling, compassion, connection. I think these are all very much the same thing. And I think they are the underpinnings of therapy, and I think they are the underpinnings of Buddhism. No. So I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about Buddhist psychology, because this is, this is fundamental to what we do. So this is going to be my take on Buddhism. You know, you have your takes on what it's about. Um, but my, my understanding, what, what is Buddhism? If somebody asks me in a few words, what's Buddhism? What does the Buddha teach? I believe that what the Buddha taught is that there is affliction in life. There is great affliction in life. You know, his, his spiritual journey began, began when he encountered instances of affliction. You know, he encountered the four sights. The sick person, the old person, the corpse. And as a result, he set out on his spiritual journey inspired by the vision of the sadhu. And I think this experience, which is at the root of our, our Buddhist understanding, you know, this gives us a clue to the importance of affliction, suffering in the spiritual path. When people come to see me as a therapist, they are generally impelled by some kind of affliction. I believe that the therapeutic journey is not just something about repair, dealing with the damage of life. I believe therapy is much more than that. I believe that therapy, like the Buddha's quest, is a spiritual journey. You know, we have the potential through our experience of facing 
the things that go wrong in our lives, we have that potential for growth. And I think that is what the Buddha showed. So basically, Buddhism is something about our relationship to suffering. What else did the Buddha teach? The Buddha taught that, for the most part, we do not allow ourselves to feel. One way or another, when we experience afflictions, we run away psychologically from them. We run away through the processes of attachment. So, you know, this is kind of basic Buddhism. What do we do? We use objects in order to distract ourselves initially from the pain of the things that are going on from ourselves. We attach ourselves to an object world. This is the technicality. What does this mean in practice? Well, it means when we're feeling rough, we, at a simple level, we have a bar of chocolate or we have a drink or we switch on the television or we go and find a friend to chat to and probably have a good gossip or we go off shopping or you know whatever it is but we use objects to distract ourselves and pull ourselves out of the distress that we're experiencing. Having done this we then shore up a sense of who we are out of these habits of behavior. And one of the reasons we do this is because we're frightened of change. You know, Buddhism talks a lot about impermanence. Most of us are frightened of impermanence. Most of us, when we experience things that are distressing, it's because in some way our sense of permanence is being disrupted. You know, we lose something. Our health is undermined. Something comes into our life that we don't like. We're disappointed by something. We get old, we get sick, we die, to quote the Suttas. We don't, we're separated from those we love, we're disappointed. You know, all of these things, they're all about change. Life is a constant flow of change. We struggle to experience those. And so we avoid them. We don't like those feelings. And we avoid them by creating a semblance of permanence, a semblance of security. And we do this through these processes of attachment that I've been talking about. So, you know, that habit of reaching for the bar of chocolate or reaching for the drink or switching on the television program or whatever it is, you know, at a simplistic level, it's very easy, it's very immediate, it's very quick. But at a longer term level, these things build up into things that support our sense of identity. And it's like we then live in a kind of glass bubble. One of my books, I, I've written a number of books on um, Buddhism, and one of the books I have a picture on the cover of, it was actually taken up in Newcastle on Tyne, and there there's an art gallery, and you can go out onto a, a balcony there. And the balcony is a, like a glass box. So you stand in this glass box and you look out at the world. And I realized when I looked at this photograph that I took some years ago that actually it was a really good analogy for what we do. Because when you look at the photograph, what you can see is that in the block box there's a reflection. There's a reflection of the gallery. But you can also see that through the glass one has a view of the other side of the river. One has a view of the other shore, uh, where there are houses and streets and other kind of city things going on. So it's like you've got this sort of superimposition. You've got this glass box that's cutting you off from the other shore, <coughs> the, the houses and the streets and so on. And the glass box is contaminated with a whole lot of reflections. And this is rather what we tend to do for ourselves to create a level of distraction from the things that are going wrong in our lives, the things that are changing, the things that make us feel uncomfortable. And so it's like we not just reach for that chocolate and reach for the television program, it's like 
the whole of our experience is what we say call conditioned. It's like whenever we go into a situation, we always go into that situation and we see it as if a, it's a kind of got a kind of reflection of ourselves within it. So like when all of you came into this tent here, each of you, myself included, will have had a different experience. You know, we come in, we see the space, and immediately we're looking around, we're grasping, we're attaching. It's a mental process, and we're doing this in order to, in some way, create a sense of security in ourselves, and to create that sense of, of permanence and reliability. You know, this is, I know what this is, this is a marquee. I'm okay, I've been in a marquee like this before, it might even be the same one last year, so I feel okay, I'm secure, I know what I'm doing, I know how to be in this tent. Yeah, I have to sit up here and give a talk, you know, but I know what to do, I know how to be here. Go into a completely strange space, one still looking around for things that are familiar. You know, I noticed when I came in here, like there was a baby crawling around. What did I find myself doing? I was immediately recognizing my grandchildren, you know. Oh yes, my grandchildren were like that at one stage, they're a bit older now, but you know, it's like I'm immediately referencing everything to my story. I'm creating my story out of what I'm seeing around me. And we're all doing this, so if I asked each of you to tell the story of what you saw when you came into here. If you think about, you know, when you walked into this space, what was the first thing you saw? Probably that's quite revealing of who you think you are. Okay? Probably the things that you noticed in some way say something about the things that are important to you. So it's like we're each living in those glass boxes and on the glass boxes are reflected all the things that tell us who we are and tell us that the world is a safe place and tell us that we can occupy those, those places. And this is okay. You know, I, I think what we have to understand with Buddhist psychology is that if we get too kind of absolute about these things, if we get too idealistic, we can say, oh yes, Buddhism says you've got to get rid of the self, you've got to kind of meditate until the ego disappears. Well, yes, in theory, maybe, but the reality is that all of us are deeply enmeshed in our ego structures and that if we suddenly tried to step out of the glass box then we couldn't handle it and actually what would happen would probably be that we would immediately reach for an even bigger box to put ourselves into because it would just be too scary and this is where the scariness comes in you know it's like we're all frightened of impermanence. Most of the time we manage to put it to the back of our minds. Most of the time we manage to keep it in small enough doses that we can take it, we can deal with it. Sometimes we even, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm saying yes we're all frightened but of impermanence and some people may say oh yes but I love change. I love things being different. But, you know, even that is a kind of permanence because it's a kind of, I love change, you know. It's like we don't escape that easily from these cycles of self-building, these cycles of repetition, these cycles of this is me, this is how I am, this is what I do, and so on. But the important thing about Buddhist practice and about therapeutic work, which is based on Buddhist principles, is that it's something about trying to find that courage which helps us to maybe just question, just a little bit. Earlier this year, some of the people in our organization, Tariki Trust, put together a collection of essays that collection of essays is called The Wisdom of Not Knowing. The essays all relate to Buddhism, psychotherapy and philosophy and a whole lot of other practices uh, in that sort of general field. And 
you know, I think this is a really important point. If somebody asks me what's the most fundamental thing that a therapist needs, I would say curiosity. I would also say not knowing, because I think the two are opposite sides of a coin. I think we have to, if we're going to go into these matters, and I say these matters because I'm not just talking about therapy, but if we're going into therapy practice, or if we're going into Buddhist practice, or if we're going into life, the more we can go in with this attitude of curiosity and not knowing, the more courageous we can be, the more we're going to actually live full, alive, spiritually based lives. So, I'd like to talk a little bit on the back of this about how we work therapeutically. Wow! <laughs> Well, that was a bit of not knowing, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, you never know what's going to come up the back of you. <laughs> I'd like to say a little bit about our, our therapeutic method because um, I know that some of the people here have talked to me uh, down on our Tariki stall and I'd like to explain a little bit of, about the sort of model that we use for working. We're interested in looking at the way that people's lives tend to be conditioned by patterns. And you see, when somebody comes into therapy, usually they're coming because in some way those patterns have started to create problems for them in their lives. They've often become over rigid. Sometimes they've become negative. Sometimes the person has become frightened because it seemed like the patterns don't work and they, they don't seem to have a kind of working model. It feels like things are falling apart. But in some ways, those, those patterns of relating to the world that construct the self, they start to fail the person. And so they, they arrive in the therapy room and they want to explore, they want to know more about their lives, they want to make sense of what's going on for them. What we're interested primarily in the therapy, our, our approach is what we call other-centered working. Other-centered approach, you, you see, the fundamental thing about our approach is that Buddhism suggests that we are all living these, these limited lives, that our, our sense of self is conditioned, as we say. It's dependent upon the things that we give attention to. The mind is conditioned by the object of attention. We are constantly framing our experience in terms of things that have gone before, and so on and so forth. And so we are particularly interested in this approach to therapy in the conditioned view that people have of the world. We're interested in the way that, as people go through life, they experience things in that constructed way that I was talking about. They, they're selective. And some of the, the selective experiencing is, as I say, based on prior experience. So we tend to be drawn to see things and to interpret things in terms of the things that we've experienced in the past. So, for example, you know, if you are in a relationship, we get people quite often will say that you know, this relationship is in some way living out the same pattern as a previous relationship, same pattern as a previous relationship. And you know, why is it that everyone I, I live with lets me down in this way? Everybody abandons me. Everybody becomes overbearing. Everybody is critical. You know, it's like time and again, we select people who tend to be similar patterns and often to replicate patterns of relationship that we've had even from childhood. So what is it, you know, that kind of replication of life might be something that we, we start to look at. But also, some of what people experience is just plain delusion. Sometimes the interpretation is just wrong. You know, I might say, well, this person is behaving towards me 
in the way that all the other people I've met, why do I keep meeting losers in my life? But actually it may be that this person I've met isn't a loser. It may be that I'm just seeing them in that way because that's the pattern of perception that I'm carrying. That's the pattern of expectation. And so in that relationship, I'm going into that relationship, I'm viewing the person in that way because that was how my previous relationship was. And they're then reacting to that expectation. They're behaving in, that, in the way that I'm inviting them to be. And so I'm creating a sort of mutually conditioning cycle where I actually set up for myself those patterns of expectation that I, I'm carrying with me. Okay, so the way that we, we tend to work with these things is to be interested in the reality of the situation with the client. We talk very much about the therapeutic process being a triangular relationship. It's a relationship in which I will, with the person, inquire into the reality of their world. I'm interested in being with the person that I'm working with and saying to them, well, show me. How do you see things? You know, tell me about the people that you work with. Tell me about what happened this last week. And incidentally, it's often just as useful to actually to look at what happened over the past week as it is to go into the past. It's useful to have a, a picture of the past, but sometimes, because we tend to seek out and repeat these patterns, actually quite often we find that what's happened over the past week is in some way uh, an exemplification of the, the kinds of patterns that the person is already carrying. So, tell me about what's, what's gone on over the last week. Who's around in your life? You know, talk about your partner, talk about the person you work with, and so on. And so the person brings their stories. And actually, we all inhabit stories. You know, I, I talked about the way that we come into a, a space like this and we see it in a conditioned way, and those conditions depend upon our past experience. But actually, this thing isn't just a static thing. It's a dynamic thing. It's a storyline. And we tend to repeat and unfold the stories that we've experienced in the past. So when the person comes along and they tell me their stories about what's gone on over the past week, the things that stand out are probably things that in some way are important metaphors or objects within the story that they live repeatedly within their life. So, okay, this is the storyline. This is the script. Let's inquire into it. So what I will do, in general, is to invite the person to tell me more. You know, this person at work that you work with, you find them difficult, they're bad-tempered, they're always cross with you, they're disapproving of your work and so on. Tell me more about that. And tell me more about the person. <coughs> you see, what we tend to do with the people around us is to view them in a functional way. Particularly when we're in that kind of work arena, that everyday arena, but even in our relationships, we tend to think of the people around us to some degree as, as being objects in our world. You know, they are my boss, my partner, my child, my parent, my... We don't actually see them as rounded people in their own right. We see them in, in a way from like cardboard cutouts. We look at them in that particular way. And because we do that, they have power over us. So our, our methodology is actually about, can we invite this person to be three-dimensional? Can we inquire into the, the third parties of the client's world? And can we invite them to become more real for this person? So when the person talks about this situation at work that's difficult, can we start to move beyond that preconception, that 
that conditioned view, that, that cardboard cutout, can we start to see the person as having a life of their own? So, okay, so, yeah, maybe this person is a bit irritable. Tell me more about what goes on in their life. Tell me more, you know, do they have a family? How do they get on in this job? How long have they been in this job? You know, is it a job they find easy? Maybe they're a bit irritable because they've only just started doing this job and they don't quite know what they're doing and they're a bit insecure. Or maybe they're, they've been doing it for too long and they're fed up and they, they'd really like to change jobs but they haven't quite got the courage to leave. Or, or maybe, you know, let's explore this situation. Okay? So this isn't the sort of typical stuff of therapy because, you know, we're not actually talking about the client directly. We're talking about the client's world. We're talking about the people in the client's world. But when we do this, what happens? Well, the person is supported in their current state by the cardboard cutouts. Not by real people, but by the cardboard cutouts. The reflective processes, the glass box, the, the constructs that are, are around them. These are what keep in place the problematic mental states that they are experiencing. So if we can start to build connection, then we can actually start to move out of our, our box and to move around the world in a more open way. We start to see other people, to see others as real, rather than just as reflections of our, ourselves. We start to connect more fully. So this, this therapeutic method is, is very much about reconnecting. It's about getting in touch with the reality of the world, rather than the constructed world that is cutting us off and insulating us from reality. Okay, I wouldn't want to kind of give you the impression that we're a kind of one method approach, and I'm obviously not going to go through the whole sort of methodology of um, other-centered working, but I, I think by this description I maybe just give you a kind of flavor of how we're working. So what we're really interested in is helping people to connect in a different way, to connect in a more real way, to let go of some of their conditioned perceptions of situations and people, and particularly with the people who are important to them. And the reason that this is effective therapeutically is partly because it does bring into challenge indirectly the kinds of mental states that people are locked into, the kinds of rigidities that people have about the world. But also, the other thing that it does is it helps to enable people to relate better. You know, when you start to think about, well, what might be going on for the person I work with that's making them so irritable and critical and so on, when I start to think about that, initially it may be quite difficult because I may be holding on to quite an agenda of kind of my irritation with them in return for their irritation for me because these things tend to feed each other. But, you know, once we get beyond that, once we, in the therapy situation, because we are at one remove from the situation, we're able to look at it a little bit obje more objectively. Once we can actually start to move out of that, then we can start to have a bit more of a kind of human response to the, the other person. And as we start to have that more human response, then something changes in a real relationship. You know, because the client is going to go back into that work situation. They're going to relate to that person. And when they go back, there's maybe going to be some understanding that that irritation isn't all personal. It's not all about me. <coughs> Because most of the time we, we tend to go through the world thinking that everything is all about us, you know. So this isn't all about me. This is, to some extent, about this person's life. And maybe in doing that, we can start to have some empathy, you know. So one of the things that we're doing in this method is to help to build empathy. Not just in the counsellor, the therapist, 
but also in the client. The client learns to have empathy. Empathy, really important. Empathy is how we connect. Connection is the way that we uphold our, our positive mental states. Connection, deeply important. This whole process of connecting in a more real way, this is fundamental to mental health. Other-centered work is about building connection. It's about breaking down the isolation, the solitary feeling of being shut in that glass box. So sometimes we do it through that kind of therapeutic exchange where we're inviting the person to experience a more direct relationship with the people that they are commonly meeting in their lives. But it can, it can work in other ways. You know, we, we do environmentally based therapies, as, I, as Stephen was saying. And, you know, taking people out into nature, this is also fundamentally important to mental health. Why? Because basically when you're outdoors, you automatically connect better. I mean, I say you automatically connect better. Yes, of course, we take our com conditioned minds out into nature. We walk through the woods and we look at the trees and we feel as if they've been planted just for our, our pleasure and, and so on. But there is still something about being in nature that connects us. There's something about the unpredictability. There's something about the fact that we see things growing and changing and the seasons and the weather. You know, you, you sit here, I've been sitting here the last three days and the weather has gone from hot to cold to blowy to still to wet to dry, you know, and it's, it's changing all the time. And when you're in that, you're just constantly being challenged to adapt and change and live in impermanence. And all of this, you know, it, it helps us to connect. It helps us to be more deeply connected. Other things, practical things. You know, I've talked with some people over the last few days about working with more severe mental health problems. You know, sometimes people are not at the stage where they can sit down and talk about their work situation. They don't have a work situation to talk about. Just doing practical things. Again, it connects us. Other-centered work can be baking a cake together. You know, and the together is important. The connection, the human connection of working with somebody in the kitchen, doing gardening, getting outside, connecting with nature, doing practical crafts, you know, all of these things, they use the hands, they use the body, they, they're practical, they're about engaging, about connecting to others. And it's through these that we, we reconnect with the world. The whole process of reconnection, the body is vitally important. If we come back to the practice of mindfulness, mindfulness very important as a foundation and also as a, a therapeutic process. You know, I've, I've recently been doing some teaching on the Satipatthana Sutta, the, the teachings on the foundations of mindfulness. It's a wonderful text in terms of psychology. The Satipatthana starts with awareness of the body, you know, sitting, being aware of sitting, being aware of the breath, connecting with that basic in-breath, out-breath, coming back to the foundation. This is connection. This is connection to something that, in a sense, is other. You know, our breath is not us. It is breath. It is air. We all breathe the same breath. You know, it's not mine to hold on to. The breath is impermanent. When we read the Satipatthana, one of the things that is 
emphasized again and again in the refrain of the Satipatthana is the arising, the coming together of conditions that are observed in the breath, in the body, in all the actions, in all the phenomena that are investigated in that text. Time and again it says that they are formed, they come out of conditions, they, they arise dependent on conditions and that they are subject to impermanence, they decay, they fall away. The whole text is a text that looks at impermanence, change. You know, mindfulness is not just being aware I am here now. We can subvert mindfulness and make it about permanence, but that's not the spirit of mindfulness. The spirit of mindfulness is about mindfulness of change, mindfulness of the fluidity of life, mindfulness of the fact that we are all composed of elements that come together and of elements that decompose and decay and so on. And you find when you read the text that in the, in the section on the body, the last two meditations that are done, the, first, the second to last is meditation on the elements, and the last one is meditation on the decomposition of the corpse, you know. So right through the practice of mindfulness, we have this idea that there is an arising and there is a passing away. There is an arising of the breath and there is a passing away of the breath. There is an arising of the body and a passing away of the body. So it's like when we, we work with connection, it's like we are moving in the direction of mindfulness. We are moving in the direction of appreciating and realizing impermanence. You know, so when I'm talking about therapeutic method as being something that brings us more into touch with others, into connection with others, it's like we are we are constantly in this sort of dilemma because on the one hand, in order to feel safe, we, we construct this glass box of self. But actually, in order to really become mentally healthy, we need to at least reduce the rigidity of that box to step out, to, to be more open. We need to have courage, you know, it's scary business. Facing the realities of life, the realities of others who are not controllable to ourselves. Facing the reality that if we really connect to others, we may really lose them, you know. That if we really love others, that they may disappoint us that they may change, that they will die, that we ourselves are subject to change, aging, impermanence. You know, facing all of these things is scary. And when we really face them, rather than just talking about facing them, then we can be very frightened by the experience, you know. So we have this, this balance. We have this balance of scale. And I, I think this is where the Satipatthana is quite interesting because in the mindfulness practice, it's like we start off from something very simple. We start off from an awareness of something very small, very ordinary, something that's with us all of the time, the breath. You know, we, we start off by observing the breath and noticing how the breath itself arises, falls away, flows, changes. Most of us can handle that. Can be an emotional business at the same time. You know, connecting with the breath can connect us to the body, to the body emotions and so on. So I don't want to kind of diminish that. But at the same time, it's a simple everyday practice. So we start off with that everyday small-scale microcosm, impermanence, 
conditioned arising. And then gradually through the text, we expand to this great awareness that actually everything is simply the coming together of elements, that everything is subject to decay and impermanence. And I think it's rather like this in therapy. I think in therapeutic process, we often start with what happened last week. You know, this is one reason why I, I think it's quite helpful to work with the everyday situations, at least initially. Good to have a picture of the big scale, but just a picture, just a story. But work with the, the everyday, work with the ordinary, work with the engagement in the ordinary, everyday happenings. And somehow through that, a transformation starts to happen. And gradually through that process of transformation, we can start to look at the bigger things. I said that I wanted to talk about courage and the courage to, to feel things, to face feelings. I think the last thing that I'd like to explore before I open up to some questions, I'd like to talk about what is it that gives us courage? What is it that enables us to go on these journeys, to, to face these, these spiritual things? You see, I, I think that, as I said at the beginning, there is a tendency these days to think in terms of people in isolation. We tend to think of ourselves in a disconnected way. And we tend to try to solve our problems on our own. The approach that we use, other-centered work, is about connection. And I think the thing that gives us courage is the same thing as can be scary. I mean, this is the paradox of it all. Because it's through finding connection that we actually find that we are not isolated. We're not on our own. That actually there are bigger processes and that the processes of life are actually trustworthy. You know, and th this is what I enjoy so much about the ecotherapy work, actually, is that... When we go outside, it's like we see this, this natural unfolding of all of these cycles of coming together and decay and impermanence and, and so on and so forth. And we can talk about them in, in simple ways and in big ways. But we also see that actually these cycles are part of a bigger whole. And the bigger whole gives us a confidence that actually there is a, a rightness about it all. That everything is, is actually held in something that is even bigger than those processes that we're looking at. That there is a trustworthiness that we can hold. There is a, a Japanese psychologist, or there wasn't a, a Japanese psychologist, He's, he died some years ago, um, called Gisho Saiko, who developed a model of therapy that I think gives us a a very nice um, example of how we can hold that, that therapeutic process. What he says is that in the therapy session, the therapist and the client come together and they meet as two individuals. In a way, they are just two people. They're isolated. They're encountering one another. They're equals. They don't know each other. They just come together they have an exchange. But he also says that beneath the surface, there are other things going on. He says that at the unconscious level, or at the spiritual level, and he talks in spiritual terms because he's a, also, besides being a psychologist, he's a Jodo Shinshu priest, and he, he talks about the way that the therapist brings to the therapy faith. This is the important healing component of the therapeutic process. So the therapist comes to the encounter with faith. The client comes with a failure of faith. The client comes because their world has fallen apart, because in some way their box is not working. They're not feeling safe. 
And so rather than recreating a box, what happens is that the client gradually comes into the therapy and starts to experience the kind of faith that the therapist has. Not directly at first, but because we are influenced by one another, because we pick up one another's moods, because actually we are all conditions for each other. We are not isolated. Somehow that, that groundedness, that solidity that the therapist has rubs off on the client. And the client gradually themselves becomes more solid, more grounded. And over the course of the therapeutic process, gradually the, the client comes to have that holding to the point where they no longer need to kind of piggyback on the therapist's solidity and their groundedness. They are able to go out into the world and take that with them. So in order to do this, this work, one of the most important things that, that we need, and whether we're working therapeutically, whether we're working on our own material, whether we're working in meditation, whatever it is, one of the most important things that we need to develop, first of all, is that, that groundedness, which is basically a connection to something that holds us, something that is, is solid. And we can do this in a very kind of embodied way, in terms of I'm sitting here, I feel myself here, sitting on the solidity of the, the cushion that I'm, I'm sitting on. You know, this is a, a wonderful embodied experience and a metaphor, both at the same time. Because I can feel this, and actually it's something I take for granted. You know, I sit down here and I don't look to see whether this is actually a solid uh, pallet or whatever it is I'm sitting on. I just take it that it's going to be solid. I take it on trust. This is an example of basic faith. You know, and it's there. And we've all got it. We all came in here and we all sat down. We all trusted that the ground was going to be solid underneath us. So this is a starting point. We can identify in our lives what is it that we just take on trust without even thinking any more about it. You know, and we all find we've got things. And these are the things that we can come back to. So if we have that sense of connection to something solid that's always with us, then actually we can face the impermanence. We can face the flow. We can face the uncertainty. We can step out of the box a bit. We can be more at ease in the world. So... You know, this is what's important, is the moving beyond taking our attention from the uncertainties, the change, into the solidity, so that we have something greater to hold that encounter with impermanence and so on. And we might see this in spiritual terms, we might see it in pragmatic terms, we might see it in metaphoric terms, we might see it in relational terms, we might see it in all sorts of different ways, you know, and different people will have a different language for it. But really, in order to have the courage, the courage is not something we develop for ourselves, it's not something that comes through our own efforts, it's something that comes through a process of recognition. It's, it, courage comes from recognizing that we have already got what we need, we already have the resources, we already have that solidity in our lives, and drawing on those resources and that solidity. And so I think the courage to feel, the courage to be with the emotions, to be with the difficult times, you know, this comes out of that experience of connection to the fundamental solidity of our lives.